Hey, my name is Martin and I'd like to show you how you can create motion charts based on language data. I'm using the corpus of historical American English from Mark Davies suite of corpora and with these data you can create really interesting graphs like this one. Um, let me walk you through what's on this graph. Um, on the x-axis we have the modal auxiliary may and on the y-axis we have the modal auxiliary might and these bubbles here are verbs that occur with may and with might. The bubble size indicates their joint frequency and the position of these bubbles indicates whether the collocates are more likely to be used with may or with might. So in this graph here we can see that say is the most frequent collocate of may, but it's not the most frequent collocate of might. The most frequent collocate of might is do. All right, um, now there's interesting things you can do with these graphs. Uh, this is still a still graph, of course, but you can hit play, and then the graph shows you how things change from the 1870s all the way through the 2000s, which is when the corpus ends. All right, so when you have nothing marked up in the graph, it's just a whole lot of bubbles uh, floating around. But the cool thing is that you can indicate <clears throat> that you want something trailed over time. For instance, I can um, mark say and hit play. And then it turns out that over time, um, say became less frequent with may, but more frequent with might. So in the 2000s, uh, it's actually somewhere very different than where it was in the 1870s. Something cool that you can look at. All right, um, so you can display collocational preferences, but you can also do all other uh, kinds of things with these motion charts. Let me show you one other thing. Here, I plotted a number of linguistic elements that can be used as either verbs or nouns in the English language. So love can be a noun, it can also be a verb. We see here that it's mostly used nominally, not so much verbally, although people love each other, right? But they're talking about love more than loving. <clears throat> um, on the other hand, we have something like look. Look is mostly a verb, not a noun, but it can be a noun. And in the middle, we have lots and lots of items that are to similar extents used verbally and nominally, right? So fear, form, and hope, uh, return, all of these are elements that are sort of balanced with regard to their verbal and nominal behavior. Okay, so um, <clears throat> you see that there's this huge cloud of things um, towards the bottom left of the graph, and that's because you have lots of low frequency elements. So for better viewability, I'm going to choose the logarithmic option here, which loosens up the cloud a little bit. And um, I'm going to deselect everything. All right. Um, and now, funny little thing I'd like you to pay attention to is the development of the verb and noun phone and the verb and noun telephone. And you see that in the 1810s no one was talking about telephones and phones because they weren't exactly invented yet. However, we can look at how things developed over time. So, um, things start taking off really in the 1950s and 60s and you see that telephone is used nominally a lot. And then it starts uh, <clears throat> being used uh, verbally. And phone comes after, because people get lazy and don't say, I telephone you, they say, I phone you. And then in the 1950s and 60s, phone and telephone are almost used in the same ways. And then telephone starts decreasing. So today, people don't say, I'll telephone you, um, although I'll start doing that. <clears throat> All right. Another thing that you can see with these motion charts. Okay. One third thing that I'd like to show you is um, <clears throat> this graph here. So this is a little more complicated. There's more information in here than in the other graphs. 
Um, here I plotted a number of English complement-taking verbs, things like try, like, want, expect, um, but also enjoy, miss, <coughs> await, think, and affirm. And these verbs, they take syntactic complements, right? So you can use try with two infinitives, I tried to call you yesterday, but you can also use it with in clauses. I tried calling you yesterday. <clears throat> or you can try um, the sushi or the pizza, right? So you can use it with different syntactic options. And um, what is shown in this graph is that here in the upper right corner, we have verbs that frequently occur with two infinitives, right? I want to, I expect to, I like to, I try to. In the upper left, we have things that occur mostly with that clauses. I doubt that John will come today. I concede that I made a mistake. I affirm that the package has arrived, and so on and so forth. And down here, we have verbs that like to occur with noun phrases. Enjoy, I enjoyed the movie, I miss you, I await the end of the semester. All right, so I labeled these axes, um, the x-axis, that clause to infinitive, and uh, the y-axis we can interpret as something like nominal things to verbal things at the top. All right. So, of course, the big question is how did things change over time? And that's something that we can look at real quick. So you see that the bigger bubbles, the most frequent ones, they stay pretty much stable, right? Even in relation to one another. And that's because, well, frequent verbs they don't seem to change their complementation behavior very much. They're very much entrenched in speakers' minds. But you see some smaller, uh, less frequent verbs zipping about and changing their behavior. And of course, it will be interesting to find, well, which are these verbs? Um, which ones do something interesting? And uh, let me just pick out one or two. Uh, one verb that does something funny is confirm. Confirm used to uh, occur almost exclusively with noun phrases and it did so well into the 1920s and then one day it woke up, found itself restless and started taking that clauses and it took more and more of that clauses and that clauses became something of a problem and um, so these days <clears throat> it almost exclusively takes that clauses. Right. Okay, there it is. Um, another verb that does something funny is the verb dislike. Dislike is, um, where is it? There it is. Okay. In the 1870s, you see, people said, I dislike to wash the dishes, which to a modern speaker is almost borderline ungrammatical. Um, let's see what happened. Okay. So you see that from the 1870s onwards, uh, dislike took fewer and fewer two infinitives. And so <clears throat> these days, it is down there with the nominal verbs. I dislike Star Wars. I dislike um, sushi, something like that. But dislike also occurs with uh, in clauses. I dislike doing the dishes. I dislike watching Star Wars. All right. So um, <clears throat> if you want to play around with these graphs yourself, uh, I made a web page. Um, that has these graphs and you can click all the options that you would like to explore um, and uh, Yeah, change what the bubble size stands for and what the bubble color stands for and um, I hope to include a Video where I show you how to actually get the Koha data and plug them into R and make your own motion charts All right, okay um, I think that's it for now. Um, see you next time.